Hello and welcome to Mjolnir at the miniseries and this is the last part of our look at Alan Bleasdale's miniseries GBH. So there are three parts prior to this. This is episode 1D, so you've got episode 1A, 1B, 1C to go. Uh, it's a bit like um, Jordan B. Peterson, isn't it? You know, so that it doesn't get mixed up with Jordan A. Peterson, C. Peterson, or D. Peterson. Uh, <laughs> the one anyway. that sounds like Kermit, or well, 1C. That's right, yeah. Yeah, well, one is here, though. That's B. Peterson, Jordan oh, B. B. Peterson. Oh, okay, yeah. right, right. Jordan C. Peterson sounds like Miss Piggy, and Jordan A. Peterson sounds like Gonzo. Oh, wow. And who's the one yeah. who got the A+. plus? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, back to the script. <laughs> <laughs> totally off track and we're only a few seconds in. That's right, yeah. This is the chaos magic that we uh, have on uh, this show anyway. Yes, so uh, looking at Alan Bleasdale's GBH, and this is the last part. So we're going to look at episodes six and seven. With me as ever are James and Neil. Hello to you. Hello. Hello. I'm David Yorkshire, and we have uh, Astrid the Red lurking in the background. She may make an appearance uh, here and there. Uh, we don't know. She's disappeared. Uh, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but she, she, she may uh, reappear at any minute because, uh, uh, you know, she just comes and goes. That's, uh, that's, that's how she is. The day of her rake can just happen like, any moment. It's like that's, Batman. How, that's how she rolls. <laughs> anyway, I should start off, actually, with a transition from episode five because we didn't really look at the end of episode five. and. The last part of episode five is where the hotelier finds Jim Nelson bollock naked. <laughs> That's right, banging up Bill. So he's been sleepwalking and he's sat, uh, sitting at the front desk of the reception, dinging the bell. <laughs> well, it could have been worse. I mean, yep. if a naked guy sitting in a chair, he could be dinging something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. This theme of madness and insanity and so on this comes back very heavily in this episode i think mm. episode six but the start of episode six is in the hotel the hotel uh, uh, is moving jim and his family to the chalet because jim can't stay in the hotel because as he <laughs> explains uh, the other guests can't see him bollock naked wandering <laughs> around <laughs> But Jim notices, of course, that he does the similar action, doesn't he? Um, the that wrist he, holding. That's right, yeah. The, the, the psychiatrist top him. Yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, go on, James, sorry. The psychiatrist top him the wrist holding, and as soon as he sees the same habit happening as the hotelier stressed, it's obvious he's been to the same person. And you can tell that a, a bond starts forming at that point. And Michael's got one too, remember? That's, he's like the... The other guy who's got the nervous tick, mm. and he almost does the same thing to stop it when he, when he does the staying alive dance, and he always grabs his wrist. So it's like a, a weird thing that they all share. Yeah, that's true. But of course, Michael never actually gets the help, so he sort of spirals and stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's why he's busy going to see a hair therapist, isn't he? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but the real star, I mean, the opening shot is this fighter jet swooping over the hotel. And you get that, actually, in the various episodes with the hotel in it. Did you notice this? Mm. Yeah, there's a few little flybys of the, the jets and the big bomber plane and stuff. Much yeah, and then on the next episode, I think episode seven starts with a big no, bomber plane. It's actually this episode, episode six, uh, that starts oh, but with but there's that. one at the start in seven as well. But in the background, there's like a, a big sort of bomber plane that flies over them, yeah. Uh, all the oh, hotelier scenes had the plane. In the, even the previous episodes they had planes and that as well, you heard or so. Yeah. Just constantly. That's right, yeah. What do you make of that? I think it was just part of the torment for the hotelier to show why he's a wreck. Because he seemed to react the worst to it. Well, one thing that I thought about was the context of this series and when it was produced. And, of course, uh, it came out in June of 1991. You'd just had the first Gulf War. And so they this, were going off to war. This again, I think that they're trying to make the link between the Conservative Party and militarism. I don't know, it might just be me, but, I, you know, because obviously it's a major government, John Major, meaning John Major, of course, the Prime Minister at the time. I think that he's trying to make this link between militarism and the Conservative Party. You have that boy who's always flying the 
the airplanes and so on, this hyperactive young boy, there's this idea that he's going to grow up to be a bit of a menace, really, because <laughs> he's not a very nice kid, is he? I thought it was more uh, that too, but it could be what I was thinking when I seen that, that people would have been aware of the Gulf War back then or coming up for it anyway. They would have associated that with the storyline in that Michael and Jim are playing this game with each other. There's all these chess pieces being moved around in this board and they're all involved somehow, but they're just like the small fish. Above them, there's even bigger people in charge and they're doing their own little war games in other countries. And that's where those jets are flying off to. So it's almost like a reminder that there's bigger things happening back then than the nonsense that was going on in this TV show, which was pale in significance to people going off to fight in Iraq or the Gulf War. Yeah, well, I mean, it, obviously it had just been and gone by the time the series mm. came out. Mm. Earlier in the year, it was all finished, but uh, it was still very much fresh in the public consciousness, of course. Mm -hmm. It is interesting in the series, they do sort of, you're focusing so much on one city, and then it does actually remind you every now and again that the, the world is bigger than the city as it pulls back a bit, mm. just yeah. for a, a brief yeah. glimpse. Yeah, that's very true. And you also get the discussions as well among the conservative conspirators that they do things in other countries, especially in Northern Ireland, mm. which gets mentioned several times, if you remember. Mm. Barbara's been to Northern Ireland to get up to all sorts, as has Lou and Peter as well. There's a joke, I'm not sure what episode it's in, but I thought it was... I thought it was a little bit offensive, I'm honest with you. And one of them says to the other character, there are some nice places in the barren wasteland that is Ireland, or, or something like that. And I was like, what? So that was a little bit, why would... Well, well, again, that's to show the morality of these characters, because, of course, the conservatives and the, the characters were meant to hate. Mm -hmm. uh, they were meant to be the villains of the piece, so that everything about them was irredeemable. <laughs> I mean, That's you right. Really, and this, absolutely hate Ireland to say that something like that, though. Remember, it's Bleasdale, uh, leftist, rightness. So you'll notice, and we'll get into this no doubt further on, is that as the ending of Seven approaches, if we get all the resolutions, there's a very distinct treatment for anybody who's bad on the left and anybody who's bad on the right. You know, you'll see a, a, a divide, and anybody who might be racist is treated different from somebody who might beat you up because they feel slighted by oppression from an evil white government or something. <laughs> you know, <laughs> those people get a totally different treatment. That's right. When in the end, of course, uh, you're getting hit in the head with a stick from one or the other. Yeah, there is very much a different standard that he uses for rightists and leftists because he's sort of the divine author. You know, he's the god that oversees all this if you like and meets out justice as a writer because he is a very didactic writer and believes in social justice of course so even though he's an atheist um, he believes in this divine justice as far as uh, his own work is concerned <laughs> it's funny that always works that way isn't it yeah that's right the people who are really foreground their atheism tend to be the most religious kind of people imaginable and most fanatic <laughs> but anyway <laughs> so yeah we've got this other character that's introduced uh, which is peter's brother who's been introduced in the last episode we know him from earlier he was never disclosed who he was he was talking to bubbles of course and now uh, we realize that he's peter's brother and he's sent to retrieve the file this is the file that's meant to incriminate michael murray his old school file and he's meant to retrieve it from the holiday center where jim's hidden the file so we have that whole escapade what did you think to this escapade Cause it, it goes on quite a bit doesn't it this trying to get the file it's uh it's almost a superhero film at this point, isn't it? You know, you've got to find, got to find the MacGuffin to beat the bad guy. <laughs> I, think, I think what's happened there, I think Michael Palin said, listen, I want to write some of this script. If you don't let me write some of this script, I'm not doing it. He said, oh, okay, give him a pen. And he's just written these slapstick moments into it. And I yeah. think you can tell that the funny stuff, he probably wrote it. But he's pretty much his Monty Python character when he's doing his funny bits. Because he is a funny guy throughout the film. But it's not in like a in your face kind of way. It's 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 a very subtle way, like what well, he would act in like one of the Monty Python movies. It's almost think, like they've given them the reins on it. I don't think Palin has a writing credit on this, and they're usually kind of funny about that in the 
film and TV world, aren't they? You immediately get your writing I'll credit. Be, we'd have had some verbal things like, let me do this scene, just play it out. It could be, but I, I wouldn't dismiss uh, Bleasteel, because Bleasteel does have a sense of comedy as well. As you'll see with the, the brother, when the car goes missing, you get a very similar sort of thing, where the brother looking baffled with the car, and he even squats and holds his hands out where the wheel should be, as if he's trying to imagine the car back into reality. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, yeah. yeah I think no, that's, uh, did, it's more Bleasteel than Palin. Yeah, then I think again, you, Robert I think Lindsay, right, though. James. I think Robert Lindsay, though, he's a he's a funny comedic actor, too, though. And I think I mean, it could be one of these things where they're two great actors and they're comedians, well, great comedians as well. And I think that it's either a good script and they just took from it and like done a home run, or they kind of said, listen, just do what you feel, you know. Well, um, according to improvise. According to the interview with Bleasdale, the only improvised bit was by Robert Lindsay when he does that mad dance outside, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, outside of Duncan's room. He's about to go in for his night of passion, and he does that bizarre dance with the shoe shine. <laughs> that was actually the only thing he came off script with. Bleasdale said that in the, the interview, so I would trust him on that. I yeah. because it seemed that Bleasdale he was praising the actors for actually being bang on cue. Bang on as he imagined it. That was this uh, consistent praise he had for them was their ability to perform to the script and do it well mm-hmm. rather than fall flat. He did develop the tick as well, though Robert Lindsay didn't he as well? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I think that was. Uh, it, I think in the script it probably just said develops a tick, and it was up to Lindsay's own abilities and actor to make that happen. That's right. Yeah. So I know that uh, Bleasdale and Robert Lindsay talked about that. That uh, basically. He improvised that quite a lot and how it developed and so on into You'd this to, uh, really, arm an waving actor. and everything. And yeah, that's, that's, that's It was right. so natural and well done. It had to come from him, that part. He has the, the greatest scene, I think, in the entire series. I think it was episode six when they're doing the, the circuit of the hotel and they do like three laps <laughs> and it's it, there's not one cut in the entire like two or three minutes that this scene um, plays out and both actors done fantastically, but he stole this, the show for the entire series on that one scene. It was fantastic. His acting ability is just, just great. I think he's the most exciting character in the entire show, and he, he really comes to life in this one. And the thing about it is it's so enthralling, his performance, that you don't actually realise they've gone round again and yeah. again until it's suddenly pointed out to you. <laughs> I thought at first when I seen this, the scene playing out, are they trying to trick us into thinking this is a really big hotel? <laughs> then when it comes out, no, they are actually doing a lap. You're like, ah, oh, that was clever. <laughs> yeah, they really are great actors, both Palin and Lindsay. So. All the acting in this actually was superb. It really was well cast and well directed. The only bugbear I have is the guy who plays Peter, and I've forgotten his name now, Andrew something or other, if I remember right. He's a guy, anyway, who plays Johnny Rotten in Sid and Nancy. Oh, uh... You can tell when he does the posh accent that it's a scouser putting on a posh accent yeah. and not the other way around. You can tell that it's that way around and not a posh guy putting on a scouse accent when it's the other way around. And that's the big bugbear I've got with the acting performances. And it's a shame because he's great for that role in everything else but that. But it's a big thing. He does have a, a right mean little face, doesn't he? <laughs> He does, yeah. He's very good at the intimidation. He's a very good actor, just not not very good at accents. Yeah, despite being such a small guy, he can look very intimidating on screen. Yeah. You see, the guy to have, it would have been, for me, someone like Robert Carlyle, actually, who's brilliant at accents, because I remember him doing... uh, I mean, he first came onto the scene in an episode of Cracker, as I remember, uh, doing a Scouse accent, actually, funnily enough. And I thought that he was from Liverpool. I didn't realise he was Scottish at the time. And then, of course, you know, he's in train spotting. And uh, and then he English did Macbeth. it. That's did right, that English Macbeth. Yeah. And the full Monty, of course, where he does a very good Yorkshire accent as well. And I've seen yeah. so, Americans ask if he was American when he does an American accent. So it must uh, be able oh, to yeah, convince everybody. He, yeah, he was in 24 as well, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah. So, yeah, I personally think that they should have got someone like Robert Carlyle in. I nearly said Thomas Carlyle. Yeah. <laughs> they can't get him in without a, a shovel. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> that's, that's right. 
Uh, can't can't get the old Scottish philosopher in. But anyway, it would have been nice if he did have made an appearance, would have completely taken over the script and transformed it into a rightist uh, epic. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's my only my only bugbear really on the acting front. So uh, anyway, we've got Peter's brother. He gets caught trying to steal the file. Anyway, there's this comic scene, of course, where Jim is sleepwalking and he. He sort of catches him. He thinks he's been caught, but then realizes he's sleepwalking. But then he wakes up and beats him with a tennis racket, which is funny. <laughs> but did you notice, yeah. though, that it's once again, Bleasdale didn't miss a trick in making the kind of toffee right wing guy look cowardly, just like Mr. Weller? As he just lay there basically screaming as he get whacked in the face with a racket from a, let's face it, very feeble looking man. Yeah, I was expecting to pull out some kind of moves and just be this, I don't know, ex-military personnel, but he turns into be a right wimp. Yeah, he just kind of sits here and says, please don't hit me again, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, like, please don't hit me again. Yeah. He didn't even try and make a run for it or something until yeah. obviously later on, but he took a beating first. That's right. Isn't it amazing how whenever you get the conservative characters, if they're anti-violent then they're seen as cowardly. Mm-hmm. And if they're violent, they're seen as thuggish. Whereas the other way around, with the leftist characters, the good leftist characters anyway, not the sort of thugs that are in there, these football hooligan types who are really sort of the pseudo-right, if you like. But the leftist characters, whenever they're violent, they're heroic. Mm-hmm. Whenever they're non-violent, they're noble. And you'll notice with the whole rake thing, there was no moral repercussion. There was no rebuke for that. It was just quite happy to beat a man bloody with a ra- oh, sorry there, ra- racket, oh god, that's, that's Astrid's fault, I'll have to say that bit again, and <laughs> I said rake, <laughs> did, uh, I just donned him with day it, day of the rake, day of the rake, <laughs> yep, oh the chaos magic at work, right, I'll say that again and just whether, edit that carefully, out or not. Huh? <laughs> I don't know whether to cut that out or not, I'll leave <laughs> it in now, <laughs> well, we're going to have to leave it in now, oh no, <laughs> Right, well, after he beats him with a racket, not a rake, though that would have been very impressive if he did. <laughs> if he beats him with the racket, there's no comeback. Well, every other bit, you know, normally there would be. Uh, the bad guys always get something. I mean, the hooligans we talked about, because they were shown as racist, they had to get the most brutal of comebacks, if you notice. Even the MI5 guys, the, the, the guys that set up race rights and problems and organised it all, get off pretty light. They just basically get a bad career move. Well, the people who actually said something racist get quite possibly killed. Yeah. I mean, that's, 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 that's right. Bleasdale's morality. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we'll come to that when we look at episode seven in particular. Mm. Then, of course, we get these uh, police who come, and then after that, these C- CID, but the CID are seen to be fake. The hotelier mm. susses them out. And so they give chase. I think the conversation between Jim and the hotelier was very interesting. Again, it foregrounds the politics. This is the thing about Bleasdale. Everybody knows about politics <laughs> yep. and about Marxist theory. And if all got an axe uh, to grind. That's right. So Jim says, they didn't look like revolutionary Marxist radicals, did they? And then the hotelier replies, neither did Marx. And he <laughs> says, true enough. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, it's funny, but... Would they know about all this, really? It's just brought into as though it's normal conversation, but it's only normal conversation for people like Bleasdale who are obsessed by politics, really. Especially as a lot of these characters don't really have an obsession with politics until it suddenly comes in, this line. Yeah. What did you make to the character of the hotelier, by the way? Because he also foregrounds politics as well as, you know, you have that speech during the storm where he talks about politics and, and about society and everything. So everybody's obsessed with society and mm-hmm. politics and so on. What do you think to him? Where is politics lie? Well, it was an obvious parody of a sort of fallen upper class with his disdain for the North. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's exactly what I thought, yeah. And uh, interestingly, he's... Bleasdale said that the whole hotel and sort of holiday thing was based on one of his own holidays. So I don't mm-hmm. know if that's a character as well that that could have been an entirely new character or manipulated, but he said all that was sort of based on his own experience. It was actually the, the first thing he was writing about that was the holiday, and then it became this big political thing focus instead. So the holiday 
was meant to be it was meant to be a holiday, and Michael Murray was meant to be the main character going on holiday, and they've rewritten it into this instead of the novel. Yeah, it, uh, doesn't doesn't seem very working class, does it, Bleasdale? Actually, when you look at it, no, because because <laughs> that's not a, that's not a working class holiday, and it's it's not even pretending to be the thing because of course even in the TV thing, he must be so aware of it because he shows the Michael Murray's brother going off to a more realistic working class holiday. So he knows the contrast. Hmm. Look at the size of his house as well. He's not he's not poor. He might have a crap car, but it doesn't mean he's not rich by any means. I mean, he can afford to go to that big fancy hotel and gardens mm-hmm. with a big house in the countryside. He's not a working class person, is he? I, I certainly course, wouldn't regard him as that. He had a whole well, is, 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 rented out. <laughs> he's meant to have gone up into the middle classes, isn't he? That he started off working class and gone up. And married someone who's obviously of the middle classes. I think that's his story. So and uh, so he's not struggling again. Then. Yeah, that's right. Bleasdale inserted himself. Although, as I say, if he went on a holiday like that as he was a kid, that, to me, marks him out as someone who's pretending to be working class who's really middle class. A bit like J.K. Rowling. Yeah. She yeah. always pretends to come from the working class because then you, you, you sort of steal a story of oppression mm. and so on. Because, uh, of course, they haven't really got that, so they have to steal one from the working classes, whom they despise at the same time. Mm. It's, it was another one of these I read recently, some guitarist complaining about his hardships and so on growing up. Except, of course, mm-hmm. he, lets, <laughs> he lets slip how it was something like 12, 14, round about, between that eight, those ages, I, he talked about buying a guitar. Except when you take the time it was written, he's talking about being underage for like a, even a, a job at 16, and he's talking about buying a guitar that in today's money would be like thousands in, in money. You know, it was, it was, it was ridiculous. Even a, a, a paper round or a part-time job as a kid, it was a vast sum. He's talking about the 50s or something and he was paying 50 quid or something. I mean, that's more than a lot mm. of people's week's wages. Or even if the, like, I know uh, even middle-class people, a lot of them were only getting about 20 quid a week back then. I can remember yeah, the conversation about chance. that back then. So he's getting somehow a wee kid is getting like a month's wage to buy a guitar, and I'm thinking this. And this guy's complaining about poverty in, in a working class background. I'm thinking bullshit. There's no way you've got a working class background and you've got a you know an ordinary working man's month's wage just to no. for a, a, a toy for a kid. Yeah, the, the only way you manage to buy a guitar that's worth thousands or, or whatever as a teenager is if, like Jimmy Page. You become extremely good as a guitarist and earn a hell of a lot of money through being a session guitarist on very early rock tracks. Uh, if you yeah. notice how many rock tracks he was on early rock tracks, uh, he actually refused to join the Yardbirds originally because he was getting far more money as a session musician. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you know. That's how big Jimmy Page was because everybody sought after him because he was that bloody good, and and yeah. they paid him enormous amounts of money. But I bet he didn't learn on the expensive gear he ended up playing on when he was a professional. <laughs> no, that's well, that's right. Well, his first guitar was, was the guitar that made him famous was the Telecaster that Jeff Beck gave him. So that that sound for the Led Zeppelin's very first album, that probably wouldn't have happened unless Jeff Beck gave him that guitar. Because everybody thinks he just walks about with that big double neck Gibson all the time, but no, he, he used a Telecaster in the first album. And that was a hand-me-down from Jeff Beck, because I believe Jimmy Page sold his guitar for drugs, which they <laughs> seem to do. They all seem to do. Oh, <laughs> just yeah. a guitar for drugs. Mm. The two Strat guitar was uh, developed for live performances of Stairway to Heaven. In fact, the original track was not recorded on a two fret guitar at all. Hmm. It was uh, recorded on two separate guitars. But anyway. Yeah, yeah. That's, I think his <laughs> playability on stage was the only thing that was ever used for. He never recorded anything with that one, though. No. Uh, we, we're kind of getting off the subject. In a bit <laughs> Sorry, get me started on Led Zeppelin. We, we, we'll have to do a, a special recording on that <laughs> in the future. Yeah, Neil can host that one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah. The, the, the holiday and the fact that Police Deal certainly wasn't working class holiday. <laughs> yeah, that's right, and, and particularly this hotel here. I think is very interesting because he's uh, he's obviously a drunk. This, as you said, James, very much a member of the fallen aristocracy or, or the fallen 
upper classes. And this is what I say about the middle classes. They hate the working class and they always lampoon the upper classes. And this is quite typical, to be honest. Well, they, of course, uh, constantly dream of joining them somehow. <laughs> that's right, yeah. Or taking their place, in fact, which is exactly what's happened. To the detriment of the world, unfortunately. But anyway, I found that interesting when they're out in the storm. Because, of course, they're both insane. And <laughs> storms are often a symbol of uh, insanity. You get that in Shakespeare's King Lear, for example when King Lear's out in the storm with the fool. And that's quite good writing, actually. And he's there, of course, with the umbrella playing lightning roulette <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, while drunk and so on. There is something quite amiable about him, though, although that might be just me. <laughs> but, 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 uh, interesting that uh, Michael Palin and his family, they obviously go out to this, this hotel to have a nice relaxing break to get away from it all. But in doing so, they've actually given the owner of the grounds the time of his life. He's probably never had like a week like that in his life. And all these crazy things happen in his resort in the one week. Burglaries, um, fake CIA agents come up. Sorry, CID agents come up. Um, he goes out in a car chase with Jim. He has all these fun experiences. It's almost like he's had the holiday <laughs> and Jim hasn't. Yeah, that's right. In, in the car chase, of course... Uh... He tells Jim to watch out for the listed building. Did you notice that as well? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so again, oh, yeah, this aristocratic attitude and, and so on. But then, of course, you have him berate these vicars who are driving. That's right, yeah. You know, he says, ram them. You know. <laughs> That's right. It wasn't, it wasn't for ramming them when he thought it was the fake CID, man. He thought it was dangerous and reckless. But as soon as he saw it was two priests or whatever, it was ram them. I go for it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's Shouting right. out the window, blaming them for the years of miserable marriage he had. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's right, yeah. Although, again, I mean, it's, it's very funny and everything, but I can't help but wonder about it being both attack on the institution of marriage and also an attack on religiosity from Bleasdale's leftist perspectives. I, think I don't know. I think it is. Because you had that earlier on from the yeah. Jim Nelson character, very explicitly attacking any idea of religion at all. That's right. It, it, it repeats itself a bit too much, doesn't it, to be incidental. And there are quips. Again, Bleasdale can't help putting politics in. You've got random people, I seem to remember, dropping in cynicism about religion over and over again. Just small things. In fact, yeah. other than, the only religious person explicitly was the mother who was shown as basically one of step off of insane. Yeah. Which yeah, I yeah. think only underlines Bleasdale's contempt. <laughs> that, that, that's right. He's very much uh, one of these militant atheists who goes on about God a bit too much, doesn't he? Or Yahweh, uh, in case, you know, we, we don't <laughs> believe in that thing either. But it's interesting that they talk about it a bit too much. You know, they, they don't have anything to put in its place. And yet they go on about it a hell of a lot. <laughs> like asking them, so what took you so long? I, to, to become an atheist, what took you so long? When you're 30, 40, 50, and they always act so proud, proud of it. I always ask them, what took you so long? You didn't figure this stuff out when you were a kid? Well, you see, I figured out the, the other thing, which is that basically we had a religion before that, and that it was our religion, mm. and uh, that it was our way of perceiving the divine in nature. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's basically what, what I came to understand, and that... Uh, all this nonsense was just theory. And it's very much exactly like leftist theory, really. It's just people waffling and trying to make impossible philosophy work. And that's why you end up with huge books of rules and then books of interpretations of the rules that don't make any sense. Yeah. And people have got to try and make some sort of bizarre sense out of this foreign import religion. Yeah. And that's right. One group of people get one version of the book, then a hundred years later you bring out another version, and most of the people end up dying as a result. Yeah, does it ever work successfully? And then, of course, Karl Marx brings out Das Kapital, and everybody says, "Oh, we've got a new Bible to work from, <laughs> and we can and we can make another nonsensical lot of theory try to work, and we just need other different theologians to work on it." Yep. So then you've got the Frankfurt School, and then you've got Marxist Leninism, and so on. When of and, course, and, and it's exactly the same. When, of course, we had something natural in place 
thousands of years before developing along just fine. Everybody had something. They were, we weren't sitting here devoid saying, oh, if only there was an import and we could suddenly have a religion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. always imported from the same tribe, you notice, as well. Mm. Very mm. strange, isn't it? Mm. Suspicious. Same with the cult of Freudianism as well. Anyway, because uh, you've must, got that as well. They must churn they? out religions there, like China churns out plastic tat. Yeah, yeah, they're pretty good at that, aren't they? Cheap religions. <laughs> <laughs> Fall apart just like the China stuff after a few years too. <laughs> <laughs> I just wish that people would use their intellect and actually look into the goldfish bowl rather than trying to see outside of the goldfish bowl from inside mm. uh, so uh, you know th- this is the these people who think they're smart at university these professors and so on they're not they're idiots basically all it is is a convoluted trick that is very much like throwing a stick for a dog into a river yeah. that's all it is an intellectualized version of that go fetch and they do so there you go any university professors who, who are listening that's exactly what I think of you. And if I get up, if, if somebody unsubscribes, we'll know it's a professor. We'll know it was you, professor. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I have a very low opinion of university professors, I'll be honest, unfortunately. I worked for a time in university, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes it an honest opinion, then. <laughs> it does, yeah. Oh, I can't stand them. Anyway... <laughs> Yeah, there are. I don't know. Like, what is what is it about them? No, that is it. Um, it's like a club, right. and um, if you're an undergraduate, what will happen is you've obviously got your seminar rooms and your various different seminars in the various different subjects that you'll have, especially in, if you're in the arts and humanities. It generally goes right. by theme or by period of history or whatever, and you have the lectures as well as. But the interesting thing is the the seminars themselves because what they will do in those seminars if is find out if you're on side or not with regard to ideology and if you are not then they will discard you if you are and if you can perform the tricks of making postmarks in our ideology work uh, with regard to things like literary criticism or arts criticism or sociology or whatever then you'll be taken to the next level and you'll do a master's degree. And then on from that, you may even skip the master's degree and go, go straight to doctorate you know, if they think that you're really on side. And it doesn't really matter your level of knowledge because I've come across professors who know jack shit, basically, right. apart from their Marxist theory. And they, they you know, know, they a lot know. About it, that's right, yeah. So a feminist will know all the different feminist critics and everything, but not very much about the primary texts, not very much about primary culture. Right. There'll be people like, uh, I, I knew one, for example, who was quite young. She was uh, uh, younger than I was, and she was talking about French literature, but couldn't read French, couldn't speak French. <laughs> You know, you know I, I read the primary texts in French. It's a bit of a problem but... if you're going to try and specialise in French literature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, and she was higher than me. And, oh, and this is how it works. So it's a club, and she was, shall we say, obviously of, uh, shall we say, the LGBT community. Oh, <laughs> and then, so, so, so the, the extra brownie points for that, oh. and, and so on. So if you're of various different things like LGBT, if you're an ethnic minority, you will also get extra points for that and you'll get raised up. And it's not about being clever at all. It's not about knowing your stuff, not your primary stuff at any rate. It's uh, It really is a scam. And I would advise anyone thinking about going into university, into the arts and humanities, not to bother, not to bother. Do something in STEM, for example. Do something in engineering or uh, sciences and stuff like that. Technology, you know, anything to do with computers is good IT. You'll not be out of a job then. You'll have something after that. Because the only thing that you can go into after you do one of those degrees, if you take an arts and humanities degrees, is basically either become a teacher or a university professor. Now, unless you're on side with the ideology, you're screwed. Mm. 
you could become a teacher in in a school because they're crying out for them but you don't want to get into that because schools are now hell on earth mm. yeah, unless you go now. into unless you go into a public school and you know, I, I was lucky for a time in that uh, I taught at public school. But anyway. Well, you should probably clarify for audiences elsewhere what that what you mean by that. No, sorry, yes. Public school uh, in Britain is is what most people call private school. Yeah, it's, a, it's actually the opposite <laughs> from what yeah. it means elsewhere. Because yes. if you say public school in America, it means the government paid. Yeah, I mean, it was, yeah. it was, it was actually an academy at any rate. So mm. that's basically what I would advise. Don't get involved in any of that because it will just drive you mad. It really, it really will, um, and and it drove me mad. And I, you know, I couldn't stand it anymore. Your colleagues are horrible. <laughs> you, you will, you'll just you'll just go home every every day, not wanting to talk to them at work. Mm. Uh, you will have no respect for them. And I, I was fortunate enough to be taught by some of the last rightist professors at university. They've since retired the old guard so you've no chance now you, mm. you know you've just got masses of leftist propagandists mm. teaching you and i remember one particular professor of mine who taught me at undergraduate who was a great man i saw him on his last day and he obviously knew that i stuck out like a sore thumb and you know and i wasn't on side with all the marxist bollocks and i saw him on his last day and i shook his hand and i, and I said i'll be sorry to see you go and he said, I won't. Oh. He said, I'm, I'm glad to be out of here. <laughs> he made it up to retirement. They couldn't get rid of him in any case because he was one of the foremost professors on his subject that there's been. Yeah. I suppose we'd better get back to uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <TV> other. <laughs> we, We've gone off tangent again. It's Astrid's fault. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, the other thing that we've got here at the moment is this relationship this strained relationship between martin and his wife martin is totally cooked isn't he yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the very very literal sense yeah but it's hard to but feel sorry for him because really. he's, a, he's a cheating bastard himself yeah and obviously a serial cheater judging by the way jim approaches the situation yeah but this... jim doesn't really seem to care jim's like oh yeah i get it all right okay whatever he's very blasé about it everybody seems yeah. to be blasé whenever these things come up because jim's wife Despite being the moral rock, seemed quite relaxed about the whole thing as yeah. well, other than a, a brief initial surprise. Yeah, that's true. But it's amazing how easily Martin accepts all this. I mean, she's pregnant with another man's child, is his wife, and yet this is perfectly fine. And and this is Bleasdale all over, isn't it? Oh, uh, it'd have yeah. to be just a complete surrender and his bizarre sort of worshipful treatment. Yeah. And this is the left entirely, that being a cuck is good. <laughs> <laughs> Dear, yeah. It's a blessing somehow. <laughs> that's that's right, yeah. One thing that Martin says as, as well, uh, I don't know if it's in this episode or in episode seven, is that he believes in the environment over heredity, which ah, is very yes. leftist, yeah. I, I think it's in the next one, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> as, if, as if the resemblance is somehow going to be changed, you know? Like you could just get a golden retriever puppy and feed it a different brand of dog biscuits and it'll turn into an Alsatian or a poodle. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's right, yeah. <laughs> it's, but I'll come on to that because um, he also contradicts himself, does Bleasdale in episode 7. But anyway, so we've got that. We've also got the worst plan that um, that I've ever seen in in my life. I mean, we, we've got Barbara and Lou. They get Murray's file after all, you know, through these fake CID and everything. Barbara takes Eileen's file out, obviously Eileen Critchley, and uh, finds out that Mr. Weller was in love with uh, Michael Murray's mother and that he saves Michael from being institutionalised, which we'll come back to in episode seven. But you have the worst plan that I've ever heard in my life, which is when Michael Murray tries to set Lou and Mervyn up did you get that? The, the, oh, this the tape is... recorder. Yeah, yeah with the... it was the one that he'd used in a, in a previous, which he, it was it was taught to him by the other guy, wasn't it? The the other guy, the, the old guy with the white hair, his name has completely gone out of my head. 
Mervin. Was, was Mervin? He was on suggested in the very first episode to do that. Mm. Was it? Yeah. Was it uh, oh right. Uh, yeah, I, I, so I thought such a, he, he, he suggests recording them for evidence. Mm. Mm. It was such an obvious attempt to get a recording, wasn't it? Could you just, yeah. could you just, you know, for a joke, give me a, a <laughs> long confession, detailed confession. Just, just say it. No, we bit louder. Say it loud and clear now. <laughs> The thing is, it also shows how clever he was because remember he he had the tape recorder on him all along. So maybe, maybe deep down he knew he had to have a back like a what's the the word I'm looking for? No, because like another plan just in case. It was Barbara that put it under the bed. Remember, it was her that suggested it and put it under the bed. Mm -hmm. So if if it wasn't for Uh that, Michael would have been screwed. So you you say you must have pressed record knowing. Well, it would have been Barbara. She she said, "Oh, belt and braces." For the backup, uh, so uh, she would uh, set it off and set it under the bed for him, and then see, walked away. Uh, uh, Michael's plan was to record it from the big reel-to-reel tape recorder in the next room, which failed. The, the whole failure of that as well was ridiculous. First, that why would they ever say the words he was obviously begging for, even for a wind-up? There's no way some MI5 or spook would ever say anything like that. Give a big confession in front of an audience. Also. Why did they bother with a convoluted plan to blast a radio at the tape? Why not just smash the tape or stop, cut the power or switch it off? Why would you go for this convoluted plan of hiding a small radio playing football? <laughs> to, to mentally torment them, maybe? Well, it's, it, they know, he'll know immediately who did it, so it's no longer a mystery. We're not at the, like the no. Eileen Critchley hidden scarf sort of thing coming through. It's, it's just a convoluted way around stopping a tape recording. Or he mm. could just not say the words because they knew they were being recorded. Just don't say and just say, I don't know what you're talking about, plan. It was all your idea. He'd panic and then you walk away. <laughs> Is it more, I thinking back, this was made in 1991, would that sort of thing be more believable back then? No, it is it, 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 it's, it's just terrible writing, I think. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's, it's I can't remember much TV from back then. Because as, as James says, why would you make such a confession? And, and I mean, I'll, I'll just give you the scripts. Sure. I actually wrote it down because it's so bad. Oh. And, and, you know, and so um, Lou says, it was our idea. It was us. We wanted to create anarchy on the streets, leading to revolution in the year God knows when. And we, not you, decided to use the ethnic minorities to our advantage by creating a group of young men who would go amongst them and knock seven shades of shit out of them. And then Mervyn <laughs> said, I wouldn't have put it quite so crudely, Lou. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, but it's true, so true. farcical. It's that, just as well you said that in your I'm reading something out voice or somebody could just clip that very nicely, couldn't they? <laughs> <laughs> Get you in a bit of bother there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm sure that'll be read out at my trial. Uh, yeah. You know, that played back to me at my trial. This is what you said. <laughs> You'll notice, please, so they'll it... script you bastards. <laughs> <laughs> You'll notice in that scene, though, what it does do is it changes Mervyn, innocent buffoon character, into actually somebody complicit with instigating tremendous violence and various corruption. Because mm. now he's no longer could be possibly seen as innocent. Yeah, and I'll tell you why as well. I think that this little bit of monologue was put in there. I think, yet again, Bleasdale thinks that his viewers are stupid. Yeah, I think you're right with that. And it's really disappointing that you would think that after almost six episodes, you would have to have the plot essentially (laughs) explained to you. The very basic of the plot explained to you all over again. Mm. In case nobody knows. It just shows a complete lack of confidence in his own writing. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And also a lack of confidence in the audience ability, which is criminal as well. Mm. If you really couldn't understand this series, and it's there's not like, there's subtle things about it, clever things, but to enjoy it, any person could really enjoy this because there's slapstick, there's, you know, a lot of interesting things happening that anybody could really enjoy. That's why it's mostly well written. But these elements where he drags it down, he shouldn't have went that route because he, the audience is going to be put off by this yet another exposition dump Yet another kind of forced scene of it, explanations. It detracts rather than adds. Was this yeah. ahead of its time, though? I mean, would it would have been, in hindsight, looking back now, we can see that same sort of thing happening nowadays. Was well, it as idea... explicit as uh, knowledge as it is now back then? Or would people watch this thinking this is really far-fetched? Because... Well, there was a lot of conspiracy stuff. Remember the whole 
Soviet Union conspiracy stuff. Mm. The films for that were still being produced at that time and also had reached its heyday before then. So people were used to the idea of complicated conspiracies, Manchurian candidate or otherwise. Mm. Yeah, that, that's right. And there were that number of people who were recruited by the KGB, who studied at Cambridge and so on, who were exposed. Was it Cambridge so, 4 or 5? Was yeah, it? That, that's right, Cambridge 4, Cambridge 5, I can't remember which. That's it right, came yeah. 5 later on, after another one went. Yeah, so there have been a number of, of these kind of things happen, and of course, we know that, like I said in one of the previous episodes, that the MI5, the Conservative Party, were infiltrating the unions. We know that Searchlight was infiltrating the National Front. Mm. This has gone on all the time. There was also so that... it's, just, it's the same now. We know that Hope Not Hate pretty much pushed national action members into doing what they did. Mm. Uh, you know, that's right, give them the bait and enough to get them locked up. So we know that this thing goes on. And this, this is what I say, you know, kids out there, if you're watching, you're young, impressionable and everything. If older people are trying to push you into things that you think, well, this seems a bit dodgy, it's probably because it is. Yeah. So I was listening to, we're the witch in the gingerbread house. <laughs> yeah. I'm always that's... suspicious of anybody demanding that other people do things they're not doing as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. If people are going to you and saying, ah, oh, you know, let's get out in the street and give them the old uh, shove the dove, the old yeah. Roman salute and everything, and uh, give it to the man, don't yeah. do it, kids. You'll get into trouble. And you'll notice uh, the people saying these things are often also the same, that somehow are coated in Teflon. You know, the the next two people that get arrested an awful lot. Yeah, mm. exactly. So... Stay out, of, stay out of trouble, watch yourselves. That's uh, that's all I have to say on that. I think that's the, the big thing that I took from this, in the entire series, though, was that those, especially uh, towards the end of the episode seven, you see those guys in the back of the truck and the guy um, drives into the Yardies gangster place, whatever it is, and they get a, a kick in or they get stabbed to death or whatever. And I'm thinking to myself, well, at the end of this, all, all these young guys who whether you're on the left or right, who are going out to these demonstrations and waving flags and getting into trouble. If somebody is pushing you. Somebody is getting you to do those things. No normal person would do that on an everyday basis. So why are you doing it at the call of somebody else who's above you? And who It's crazy. Sitting, he, and the guy probably pushing you to do it will be sitting at home drinking a beer. Yeah, making lots of money. Not, never getting involved in any fights. Never going to jail. Never getting into trouble. Yeah, that's very much uh, so. I knew a sociology teacher, college teacher, who was the first to sing the red flag, the first to mm. shout at people to, you know, to charge the police and everything, and then the uh, the first to run to the back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One of those. Yeah. So uh, always watch out for the people who shout loudest from the rear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, how does it go? Uh, Us and Them by uh, Pink Floyd. <laughs> For, forward he cried from the rear and the front flank died. Uh. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the other scene that is very, very crude, because as, as we've talked about, Bleasdale tends to lay things on with a trowel sometimes and completely like subtlety, is this where you have this racist counsellor berating Murray for the race riots. Did you <laughs> no, notice that? It's absurd way. Yeah. 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 I, and again, I wrote the speech down because, again, I think that it's something that's so crudely written. Special voice, Dave. Special voice. Make it obvious. <laughs> that's right, I yeah. know what this speech is. Make it obvious it's a reading out voice. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. She'll do it in my laconic way. So, you know, he first starts off with Michael Murray, the white man's burden, eh? Which, of course, is a reference to Rudyard Kipling, who's a rightist writer, as a rightist poet. So he's having a go at Kipling, just as he's done T.S. Eliot. And then he says, 
I'll tell you how our colonial friends should be treated, in his northern working class voice, uh, like our women should be treated, well fed and beaten and walking 15 paces behind you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, so he's got everything in there. It's you to know, make he's, him he's got... as much of our disgusting villain as possible. <laughs> That's right, yeah, he's got misogyny in there, he's got racism in there, oh, he must have. Had a right wank That's after it, Because that. even somebody that maybe doesn't like all this immigration will be going, oh, wait a minute, you're not going to be beating my sister, you're swine. You know, that's in the back of his head. Yeah. Yeah. But what I find interesting is this bit about walking 15 paces behind you. Isn't that exactly what they have in Islam, where the woman has to walk several paces behind the man, you know, in fundamentalist Islam? Ooh. But isn't the left making friends with fundamentalist Islam all the time? Interestingly, that's the one thing that Bleasdale did draw the line at. He did in his interview in a small credit, but this is why, of course, he's also hated by the left. He did say complain about fundamentalism, but included fundamentalist Islam and he's uh, complaint about it all. So it at least, it at least was somewhat even with that one thing in his interview. <laughs> Well, you, you certainly don't get that in this miniseries because all the Pakistani characters are treated extremely well. Ah, but you see, he's a leftist, so he believes that the ones that are bad are just the bad ones. You see, and the rest will all integrate and they're fine. That's how he looks at it. You're looking <laughs> at it from a rational point of view. You've got to look at it from his. <laughs> what was the What was the emphasis on um, Islam back then? I'm a little bit too young to remember. I didn't even know what a Muslim was until 9-11. So what was the opinion towards them? Were they as feared? Well, feared is maybe the wrong word. Disliked? Was there any um, rivalry between them and white people back then? Or oh. did it suddenly take off? I mean, what was the public opinion of them back then? Well, certainly the the only reason that we didn't have all the child rapes and everything by Muslims was because whites kept them in their place. And I'm afraid that's how things are on the street level in that you know people talk about skinheads and so on but there are there are idiot skinheads if you like and and there are ones who have some morality about them hmm. so i'm not going to tie them all with the same brush and i'm not going to be no. i'm neither going to be an apologist for them and i'm not going to decry them either because you know you get good ones and you get not so good ones and certainly the good ones were the only one thing that kept Muslims in their place in a multi-racial society that should never have happened, of course. The left, of course, brought these people in to create chaos because, of course, we had a reasonably homogenous society at one time, hmm. but or I should say homogeneous society because uh, um, we often mispronounce that word. The left brought these people over and they brought them over to create chaos and to cause trouble. We know that, of course, because of this article that was written by Tony Blair's aide, Andrew Nieder, was it, if I remember rightly? And he said that basically we opened the doors to mass immigration to rub the right's nose in diversity and make sure there was no comeback. He actually said that. And he sat in on the meetings of New Labour when it was discussed. So... Andrew Neither, sorry, Andrew Neither, his name. <laughs> and of course, so, it immediately so, destroys any of their noble claims for it. Yeah. You say, well, it, there's it the was, motivation. Yeah, it was done purely for power, purely for power. And sod all the poor young girls who's been raped, sod all the poor young boys who've been tortured and murdered, which the left, uh, of course, the leftist media sweeps under the carpet. People like poor Chris Donald, of course, who never gets a mention, unlike St. Stephen of Lawrence. <laughs> yeah, but they'll speak about it if it's a Catholic church. They'll speak about it endlessly. That's right. Charlene Downs, of course, who also got a media blackout. Yeah. And the left did this to people. The left are responsible for the rape and murder of thousands and thousands of people. Because they instigate a new situation and a problem with no solution as well. I mean, that's the thing. They never said, well, we want these people there, and this is how it'll work. They just forced it on people and just let the chaos happen. That's right. There are people being stabbed to death now every single day on the streets of London. I think... Uh, London, yeah. London is now one of the most dangerous cities to visit. 
and there's more than one yeah. acid attack a day. You know, you see the results. Was it four hundred odd? So it averages out more than one a day. That, that's People right. are being murdered less in Jack the Ripper's time. Yeah. Think about that. And you think mm. you look at the old footage of London, which is available on YouTube for anybody be interested. You can look at footage of London, and it's remarkable how you see the middle class and working class areas how clean and safe it is. You know, they didn't they didn't even have litter campaigns and demanding this and that. But you see how clean it is. You see shops with no big shutters to protect them, with big windows with, with goods in them. Nobody's touching them. Nobody's graffitiing them, smashing them up, or robbing them. People just enjoying life. So it, it immediately shows evidence of a completely different culture and people. Yeah, that's right. Because why would you wreck your own society? Mm. It, it, there has to be something very wrong with you if you want to wreck your own society. But that's precisely what the left have done, mm. and it shows that there's something fundamentally wrong with them. It, make, it makes me sometimes wonder. This, uh, th- like they talk about race wars, white people being Nazis and taking over the world. I'm wondering if deep down most of them actually want us to be the way they think we are, and they want the world to be destroyed, and they want everything to get torn down. There's no moral reasons behind what they're doing. There's no convictions. They just want to see the world burn. Well, there is and a they'll hop on any any movement that will bring that quicker. Mm. Yeah, well, there is a strong sense of self hate with most of them. I find when you yeah. start pushing and digging, you'll find this. Often, it's not even very hard to find. You'll know, start talking about how terrible their own people are, how they deserve this and that and the other. Well, of course, they're usually sitting in comfort when other people are suffering. This is, of course, the the game they play. They're too cowardly to actually take the punishment they claim that everyone deserves of their own people. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, they transfer. I've seen this online as well when I've debated with a leftist. This leftist has gone about the on about that we shouldn't have children and that, oh, you know, um, this is uh, horrible and people, uh, you know, we should be wiped out and everything as a race because we've done terrible things. So why don't you commit suicide? <laughs> and he said, no, I, I live to make sure that other people don't have children and that the white race is wiped out. Uh, It's perverse, isn't it? Absolutely perverse. I remember there was a study that showed that they can actually use some sort of magnetic fields, you know, in medical science, in testing, to shut down parts of the brain. Now, you know, to interfere with them. And they found that if they shut down parts of the brain, they can make people more amenable to leftist ideas, uh, immigration and so on when they test them. And you've got to wonder, is it actually just a mental disease? Is part of the brain defective when you get that kind of extreme leftism? Well, it could well th- be from that test, couldn't it? Yeah, I, I think so. I think that uh, one of the major things that's happened over the past uh, few years, uh, well, in decades even, is more of a dependence on drugs, mm. uh, either prescription or otherwise which are also mind-altering, of course. And it's been proven now that if you take it at a, even a, a sort of 12 to 14 and onwards ages, it does actually have an effect on the brain quite significantly. Alters behaviour, yeah. risk behaviours, all sorts. So that's a, a life-changing alteration to your brain. Yeah, because yeah. if you notice, all leftists say that uh, all young people should experiment with drugs when they're young, you know, because it's cool. And... They, the one thing that I see when they get into that stuff is they become more amenable to be persuaded by leftist thought. Mm. Of course, it's part of a bigger picture in that they're leading a less natural life because the left is really the force of anti-nature. That's what the left comes down to. The true right believes in nature and it believes in natural law. This is why the left detests nature and they're always trying to destroy Trees and green spaces and so on. And disguise uh, it with some moral narrative, mm. like yeah. uh, soy and milk. And they, but they don't tell you all the jungle that's got to be chopped down in order for those fields to be sown or it. plowed. They'll pretend to be the caring ones, yet advocate yeah. for infinite population growth, constant flooding of immigration into every country in the West, despite the fact that it'll obviously destroy green spaces here, as you have to build for them. Yeah. That's right. To get this on my chest, Dave Gilmore's guitar collection sold his guitar for three point nine million. What did he do it for? For that's right, global warming. 
oh. awareness. Because I'm sure the pole caps are just going to suddenly start fucking melting, David. Now that you sold your guitar. <laughs> yeah. You, you see, if, if if I'd sold a guitar for that amount of money, I would have bought a huge plot of land. And I would have planted trees. Absolutely yeah, right. That's what you do. Even we yeah. can think of something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and get. that's <laughs> that's how you get nature back into the balance. Mm. Not, not by some fucking bananas theories about global warming that can neither be proven nor disproven because, of course, there are many different factors and, and the world heats up and cools down all the time. So we'll never know how much of it is to do with man. Yeah. Yep. And so it's, it's a con trick. And, and it's because certain businessmen have got their money, like Al Gore, into certain technologies that have uh, been brought about because of this idea of global warming, which has been pushed since the 1960s, actually, if you look at the film Soil and Green. Yep. And oddly and, enough, they're, every time they make a prediction of a date, the dates seem to just come and go, and yet the apocalypse still hasn't happened last time I checked out the window. Yeah. No, that, that's, that's sun, right. The sun's still there. <laughs> yeah. They had signs up in America at some of the parks saying, they put them up years ago saying, oh, by 2020, this glacier will melt and disappear. They've had to take them down now because obviously <laughs> people are looking at them halfway through this year saying it's not long to go now. Yeah. And it turned yeah. out the glaciers not only hadn't melted, they'd grown 25%. Yeah. So there's their predictions yeah. for them. Absolute bullshit. If you can't predict something, I've no interest in what your claim is going to happen tomorrow. Well, it's, it's like this. Why are the same people who are banging on about global warming and CO2 emissions, the same people who produce things like fizzy pop <laughs> and are cutting down the South American rainforest with no seeming contradiction in their thought. Mm. Well, because in reality, yeah. the whole business is about gaining power over people and money. It's allowed them to introduce all sorts of regulations, new taxes, new government bodies. Yeah. That's so, the real game. There as well. There's this uh, thing about plastic bottles now. We're going to have a little bit off topic, but this is quite interesting. They're going on about plastic bottles and how we should stop throwing them in the bins in the oceans like we do, like we just want and wonder out throwing plastic bottles <laughs> into the ocean. Or, well, like you don't, people you actually don't, do that. You don't spend a Saturday with a, a bin bag of old bottles thrown yeah, in the sea them with, in the sea, like, <laughs> Yeah, because people do that. What, or, or is it more that the fact that these bottles that they want us to hand over to be recycling go into products that get turned into fleeces? that you sell in shops for hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Is that not really why they want your plastic bottles? Or is it because some polar bear got it stuck in his face one time? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, there are islands of plastic floating around the China. oceans and everything, yeah. particularly around China, that's right. In Indonesia, the most polluted place in the world. Yeah. Mm. I mean, 90% of the plastic pollution is actually known to come from Africa and China together. Yeah. Yeah. And it's only a handful of rivers it actually comes out of, this 90% of the world's yeah. rivers. So in reality, it's nothing really that... There's, I mean, I would like you know zero mess because you know nature should be preserved. So I certainly wouldn't uh, be lax on uh, Europe or America's behaving that way, but it's ridiculous that they're complaining about the tiny amounts here while just turning a blind eye to the absolute disgusting mess that's left by Africa and China. There's always someone making money from this regardless. Someone is making lots of big bucks from this, especially oh, wow. recycled plastic. I mean, you're not going to tell me anybody's like just sitting back and taking a beating for that. Somebody is making a lot of money mm -hmm. from that. That's the real reason. I wish they'd just stop lying to us and saying, oh, we're doing this to save the fish, folks. No, you're doing it to make money. Just admit it and I'll, <laughs> I'll play, play ball. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's another way of getting people into this globalist idea as well, this ide ideology of globalism, because if you notice, it's all about coming together and saving the planet as a whole. Well, no, you start on your own doorstep. Mm, if yeah. everyone looks after their own corner of the world, which they know well, then things go pretty smoothly. Yeah. It's that easy. Nationalism is a great morality. It's an ethical way of looking at the world because you have to look after things on your own doorstep. 
and not just kind of throw money in a jar that's going to go to a team of administrators somewhere across the world or something. We'll no. give them money for tribesmen to buy AK-47s. <laughs> that's right. You, you, you sort out the rubbish on your own doorstep, you plant trees, you look after them. And so on. It, it, it really is that simple. And it's easy to get people to do it because if you say to somebody, wouldn't you like your area where you live to be nicer? Well, the answer's obvious. Well, if you try and convince a bunch of people on one side of the world, wouldn't you like that side of the world you'll never see and you'll never meet the people or care about them? For their bit to be nicer, it's very hard to convince them. It's always best to concentrate on your own back garden for that reason. Yeah. yeah. Just motivate Ask people it. to improve their own area. Yeah. Ask yourself why India is not giving Scotland money to help with its fish farming or anything like that, or to plough its fields or anything like that. Why is that? Yeah, because one thing that we should be doing instead of giving foreign aid is actually creating fish farms so that one we can feed ourselves, and two we should be releasing a percentage of those films back into the North Sea mm. because the North Sea has been barren. For like 20 years or more. Yeah, it's The fact that um, ships have allowed to have just cleaned it out. That's right. And you have to ban these modern ways of fishing with the micro nets because it's just absolutely destroyed the entire ecosystem. But of course, nothing's been said about this. Why didn't the Labour Party do something? You know, this is the left. Why didn't they do something about that when they got into power? And All the Conservatives the before that and, and the Labour before that and so on. None of them do anything about yeah. it. It's even worse is we know for a fact there's all sorts of illegal fishing going on, including these some of these huge trawlers and factory ships doing it. And yet, well, we've got a navy. We know that there's satellites that spy on things. They've got radar and all sorts of detection things. There's no way a massive fishing boat or factory ship can come in and nobody notices it. So they're seeing these things happen and doing nothing when they're just cleaning out these areas so it's financially it's a disaster for the local fishermen but also if they actually the government actually cared about the environment at all like they claim surely they would intervene with this trespasser all the while that idiot nicola sturgeon is bleating on about independence well what's yep. she doing about, yeah, what's she doing about the fisheries nothing. what's she doing about she's fucking nothing well, exactly and the thing is that if scotland got independence you would just have the same bunch of bureaucratic idiots with the same mentality as the people in Westminster now. Yeah, just Scottish uh, versions. Yeah, because That's none right. of these people are actually nationalist anyway. They're only in this game for their own jobs. They're in That's there right. to get power for themselves, to play a game and get promotions and keep their, their party going. In fact, almost dragging it back onto top of it, they are exactly the same as the way the parties work in this. They just care about the party machine, keeping themselves going in their jobs and careers. Yeah, the actual the, the one... stated moral claims of the party is completely ignored in practice. Yeah, at least in this series, you have a bit of honesty in that one of the things that Michael Murray gets done for in the end with the corruption is his uh, selling off of land to supermarket chain Tesco and he does illegal land deals. So there is at least a bit of honesty there. But again, you'll notice that all this takes place in the city, more or less, mm. uh, away from nature. It's interesting that one of the bunch of people who comes to save the day is the Burns family who are farmers. Did you notice that? You see, you always come back to the right in the end. <laughs> <laughs> Even Bleasdale can't help himself. No, he, he, he can't because he often forgets his ideology because you have to really force things. Because the right is the right way of looking at things. And of course, if he's trying to make a realistic and good story, at some point he's going to have to hit on it. Otherwise, the story would have been a mess. Yeah, that's right. And in fact, I'm going to make the transition really between episode six and episode seven here because I'm going to come on to this meeting that they have in the Labour Club mm. where Jim Nelson has to go and defend himself against these charges of bringing the party into disrepute at the same time as Murray gets confronted with his corruption and so on. And of course, it's the Burns family that put the leftist thugs in their place because they heckle 
Jim when he tries to give his speech and everything. And then he's allowed to give his speech. And I thought that his speech was very interesting because he says, he talks about Das Kapital. And uh, here again, he goes again, Alan Bleasdale goes against Marxist Leninism. And he, because really it's Bleasdale putting words, his own words, really, that he would like to say mm. in Jim's mouth. And he berates these leftist thugs for only reading Das Kapital and that they haven't got a rounded view of life, that they should read more books, you know, read two books, read three books, he says. Then he says, two wrongs don't make a right or a left, especially not a left. So you have this dig at rightism there. But actually, if you look at things etymologically, the opposite of right is both left and wrong. <laughs> uh, that is there for a reason. <laughs> mm. uh, don't, don't forget that, of course, the word sinister that comes from Latin is the word for left in Latin. Mm. And so there is this idea of wrongness all the time with the left. And this is absolutely it politically, because... You can have all the theory in the world, but you always come back to nature. Nature is moral and nature is good. And so when Jim gives this speech about socialism is the redistribution not only of wealth, but of care and concern and equality and decency and belief in humankind, it's just babble, really. And you know, the, the sad part yeah. is you describing it as babble is Bleasdale said he spent longer on that than anything else with the script. That was yeah. his words. So, <laughs> his pride and joy, <laughs> babble. <laughs> <laughs> One out of ten, please try again. Yeah. Well, you know, he he comes out with all this about equality and decency and beliefs in humankind and everything. But Jonathan Bowden, you know, the great writer, thinker and orator and philosopher, he got the left spot on, and he said that the left believes in equality and that man can be remolded and made more equal and that it will stop all struggle and everyone will live in harmony and everything. And then suddenly they realize the reality is that, well, people are a bit selfish. They're, you know, they can be good, but also they can be nasty. They can, you know, be selfish, but also have acts of altruism and so on, because people are well-rounded. And it's what the right have always realized. Mm. But then the left become entirely dissatisfied with man. And that's when you get the sort of purges and the gulags and so on to stamp on people when they don't behave as the left want them to. Like a sort of monstrous parent disappointed yeah. their children, lashing out. That's right. Bowden always said that about Christians and about leftists and so on, he said that you've got a belief in how man should be, but I've got a belief that's based on man how he is. Mm. And that's an important difference between the left and the right. The left always wants to remold and remodel man, whereas the right accepts man how he is. Yeah, I've um, had arguments like this before with people when you they come up with how things should be done and then you explain to them, well, people aren't like that, that won't work. And they say, ah, but people should be like that, though. They should be. <laughs> they never seem to accept that the fact that people aren't as who they think they are, therefore their plan doesn't work and their own admission mm. somehow doesn't count. They just think, well, we'll make, do the plan anyway and somehow people will just fit what I hope will work. Yeah. That's right. You, you see, the right believes that basically man is uh, well, he's an animal, basically. And animals, uh, they behave for their own interests and so on quite a lot of the time. Although they also behave for the good of the group. And these things should work in tandem, ideally. And, and so that's what the right tries to get people to do. And that's why you have nationalism. So you have the idea of the individual working for the benefit of the group and the group working for the benefit of the individual because rightist thought is reciprocal, you see. Mm. Natural law is reciprocal. The left just have this idea that they can recreate everything 
and they can't because it just won't work. Nature is there for a purpose. Things are how they are because it works, but they have a morality that doesn't go with nature. And this, this goes as well for Christians. They have a morality that is not hand in glove with nature. And again, they want to try to remold man and recreate him and make him good. But what is good exactly? Well, it's based on all these retarded nonsense that you have in the Bible. But my view is that basically, like most prophet writers anyway, that you only stamp on the excesses of man. If he murders someone, you have to come down on him. Rape someone, you have to come down on him. If uh, his vices are get out of hand, you have to come down on him. But that's it, really. So, yeah, you get this nonsense in this meeting. I think that the meeting is very interesting in that you get the contrast between Jim and Michael again, because it's the first time they've come together for quite a few episodes, actually. Yeah, it's quite exciting. It was a bit like Star Wars when they, the, the two arch nemesis <laughs> meet each other in the toilet. And, although it's and they not... had that big conversation. It was fascinating. And although it's mm. not immediately obvious, you do get the explanation that several months pass between some of these episodes because obviously in the earlier episode the school term starts and then it finishes and mm. so on so you realize it's actually quite a long time obviously yeah not, that's right because you might be watching it thinking oh it's just a continuation of days each episode but it's certainly not it goes on longer that's right mm. so you that's can tell right. there's been a, like a rival there for for quite a long time now yeah and it's been festering and festering for all these months which kind of explains how Everybody's got time to plan, and things have got time to sort of prey on Michael, as it does. Yeah. Mm. And obviously Jim as well. So I'll tell you one thing I found interesting about the meeting as well. When the meeting's not yet started, and there are all the wives there. There's a comment on the wives, and they're all there in the audience, knitting, waiting for this uh, sentencing to happen and everything. I thought that that was a good scene, actually, because it references... Well, Dickens is a tale of two cities uh, with this character of the vengeance who's sat there knitting, waiting for the guillotine because mm. uh, it's it's set in the Revolu uh, French Revolution. It's based on Carlyle's, uh, Thomas Carlyle's The French Revolution, oh. the you know, the history. And Carlyle describes all this about, you know, women knitting as they're waiting for the aristocrats to come and be beheaded and so on. And so you have this idea you know that these two great men if you like are coming up to be guillotined or, or whatever <laughs> yeah. so, so i thought that that was, was that was very clever but again he's had to borrow from two writists there mm. uh dickens and carlisle <laughs> so as i say you always come back to the right <laughs> <laughs> what makes that even more salty for him is that that was the more interesting part of the scene <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't original <laughs> yeah. for him. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. It's strange how, though, how the, the end duel, if you like, or the end confrontation, it isn't in a particularly glamorous place. It's in a toilet. It's not in like the, the, a courtroom or anything like that. There's, there's nothing spectacular about it. It's in a toilet, and it's just two guys just getting something off their chest. It's just an interesting scene that way. You expect a shouting match or this one trying to destroy the other, but it never quite comes to that. Mm. Yeah, it's almost like uh, they forgive each other in a way. I think uh, Michael was so broken that Jim just felt pity for him at that point. Hence, handing over the school mm. in the psychiatric report. Or did they do what two men would do in a situation like that? Just forget about it. Just say, right, let's just put an end to this and not make it any more uh, glamorous than what it was. Because I think both of them were getting sick of the media attention, the entourage, yeah. and they just said, like, just as men, just okay, we've both done some rotten things but let's forget about it yeah i think that was part of it also because michael knew at this point his destiny was sort of set in stone he knew mm. it was all over and jim probably could see that in him and i'd imagine jim's not stupid to think that if he wouldn't be the only person holding photocopies of all these reports and photographs showing bribes and so on so mm. it was obvious that michael one way or the other would be destroyed and the only thing jim had at stake was his membership of the club so I mean, he might have some pride, but it's not the end of the world for him. He still gets his family mm. and his job after this is sorted out. Well, Michael Murray is a politician and he's about to head to jail. Yeah. Uh, in contrast to these two, who both are seen 
in some ways sympathetically, even though Michael Murray might not deserve it very much, you have a glimpse, a contrast with this big cheese, which is Judge Critchley. Mm. And he is seen as absolute evil, isn't he? Oh, it was, it, it, mm. it was like, it was like Darth Vader. Or Sidious. Yeah. <laughs> the, the Emperor, yeah, that's yeah. right. It was, it Emperor was ridiculous. Palpatine. Yeah. Um, talking that about these pathetic the people, better. how they, they wouldn't be guilty if they were sorry, they wouldn't be innocent if they're in the dock, so they must be guilty. Oh, they're pleading innocent, but that's what they would say. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. And, you know, he talks about keeping the order, occasionally taking revenge in their with place. awareness, without emotion. Yes. And the. Uh, the interesting thing that he says is all justice being revenge, mm. which contrasts with what Barbara says when she turns against him because Barbara's uh, his daughter, as is Eileen Critchley, who was Michael Murray's nemesis when he was a child. And she says to him, such Olympian heights, it must be cold up there. And I thought that that was very interesting in that you've got this all justice being revenge from Judge Critchley, and she accusing him of behaving in a Hellenic way, because revenge I associate with the Judaic way of thinking. Mm. And so they've been reversed here. But given Bleasdale's marriage, <laughs> I think uh, that might explain it somehow. Mm. Uh, but, yeah. but anyway, there is certainly this swapping of Judaic and Hellenic thought there uh, in his character, but he's certainly seen as absolute evil, and there's no mitigating circumstances whatsoever, that's unlike English. with other characters. Because he's true right wing, so that's how he's got to be <laughs> a comical evil villain. Yes, that's right. Um, you also get more unsatisfactory bits of narrative here, like when... Peter sets the leftists up and, and the mob up by putting the police uniforms in the bins of the Labour Club. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you notice that? Oh, yeah. It's terrible. Very you know, subtle. It, yeah, it, it, it's just as bad as when the mob were tossing the police ID onto the beaten bodies of the ethnic minorities yeah. that are just beaten up. It really is so bad. It, you know, it's almost like uh, some, I don't know, an Arab passport turning up. Uh, <laughs> and it, when is, Israel wants a country invaded, isn't it? One yeah. of those fireproof ones, Dave. <laughs> yeah. One of those asbestos ones, you mean? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, yes, uh, Iran's next on the list. Anyway, um, but yeah, so the, there are some very unsatisfactory things. I'm not sure how realistic that is. And uh, you, you, you get a caricature as well of the press, mm. you know, that, that they come round, very much paparazzi, very st stereotypical. Although, to be honest, they are like that in real life, actually. Yep. So then uh, we get to the end, of course. We find out about Michael Murray's childhood and that... Uh, Eileen Critchley was obsessed with Ruth Ellis. So unfortunately, uh, they'd given that away in previous episodes. Yeah. So it's sort of trying to reveal it, but I thought, well, I already divined all this information already. Yeah. So you're just sort of giving me the full scene that you already teased at. Yeah. Very That's disappointing right. for that reason. That's right. He tends to repeat things in case you've forgotten, doesn't he? Mm. Which it didn't really need to do with many series. I could see if it was some sort of soap opera that had been going on 40 years, but no, not a, mm -hmm. a mini series. Yeah, that's right. And so Michael Murray found, finds out everything, basically, that Barbara is Eileen Critchley's sister. He has this breakdown and so on. And Barbara takes him to the police station. He's very calm by that point, isn't he? Sort of resigned and yet very peaceful mm. yeah. in the I car. Think, uh, he knows everything that could happen has happened, so he's just going with it by this point. That's right, yeah, because the police, of course, have issued this warrant for his arrest. For inciting riots and for and corruption. The, the mobs so. are attacking the town hall where he's, his job was. So he knows mm. if he goes one way, there's a mob. If he goes the other way, he gets prison. In one of the worst effect, special effects I've ever seen in my life, 
Well, did you see that when uh, Lou Barnes and Peter are observing the town hall going up in flames? Oh, it's, yeah. That was dreadful. <laughs> that was, <laughs> the, 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 the flames, it, it looked like somebody was shining a, a projector or something. It was absolutely awful. <laughs> I thought someone had set fire to a piece of paper, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and sort of maybe they flighted it off a bit of glass or something. Yeah, that's, that's right. Oh, it was like terrible. something you would do in the old silent film where you just... <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Something out of Godzilla, the old Godzilla. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I think I might be insulting Godzilla. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, we have then coming towards the end when everything's being wrapped up, and you you have, of course, this great exposition and uh, Philip coming in and giving him the information about who everyone is and so on. Yeah. But then you have this ending. The, the ending is with Jim and Laura basically being smug while listening to jazz. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think that that's quite a telling ending for the left, really. It's just really how they are, isn't it? Smug and listening to jazz. Yeah. <laughs> so is how I think jazz. You know, no, that's that's right. Nobody listens to jazz. Everybody <laughs> says that they listen to jazz, but nobody does. Yeah. <laughs> and anybody who does listen to jazz, I hate jazz. It's just... I, <laughs> can is you it, tell? Is your, is your real name Johnny? Yeah. Johnny no, hates just, jazz. No, I just can't stand it. It's just crazy music. It's crazy person's music. <laughs> nobody got that joke, because I remember now that you, you're both about 10 years younger than I am. It was a band in the 1980s. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, before that time, Dave... I can't even remember the names of all the Thundercats. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, anyway, that, that, that was weird, wasn't it? How Chitaru was made up for you to fancy her and everything. Bit of transhumanism going on there. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just sort of out of interest, who's your favourite character? Because we're, we're bringing things to a close now um, by the series. Who's your favourite character in the series? Favourite as in you would go for a pint with him or favourite as in best acted? As in the character you like the most. Yeah, it's go to be for Michael it. for me. Go to be Michael. Really? I mean, yeah. at all points I was kind of I was kind of rooting for him the most. Were you? Yeah, and at the end I was really hoping that he got away with it. Oh. I, yeah, I, I controversial, I know. <laughs> bad. <laughs> yeah, bad deal. Bad deal. Bad deal. You'd have had blacks as your neighbours and everything. Uh, it was a character. I know he's not like a real person, but um, I just liked the character. I thought it was it was interesting to watch. I preferred the parts of the series that he was in. Um, yeah. I thought they were more enjoyable. I, I would have thought going into it that I would have preferred Michael Palin's character because uh, I like Michael Palin as a comedian. I like Monty Python movies. Um, I like him, but I just didn't like his character that much. He didn't really excite me in any way uh, mm. michael's did michael's really got me interested in getting up close to the screen maybe just the acting ability of the guy yeah that's how good enough of an actor he was uh, before i go on to james uh, I, I just want to point something out which i forgot about actually and that's uh, when young eileen and young barbara are on the bed and eileen saying how she got him you know she got him and now it's your turn and you'll like getting him. He's easy. Did you notice she was holding a gollywog? Yeah. yeah I, I was going to mention that. I, I forgot to mention. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I just thought I'd bring it up. But anyway. One creepy uh, kid yeah. the way she's acted. Very good acting. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's the uh, girl, actually. She goes on to play Liam Battersby in Coronation Street. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Remember yeah. her. Same, same, actually. Anna Friel's in it as well as one of uh, Jim's children who Did goes she... on to playing Brookside, yeah. Did you not notice that? No, I never noticed. Yeah, I, I'm the same. I don't watch much TV. No, I, I, I don't, but... Uh, I you know, can't back out now. I, I know you're a fan. Yeah. <laughs> my, you can my, tell us the plots of who's sleeping with who this week. <laughs> don't my lie. Bloody, <laughs> my bloody mother watched uh, these soaps religiously. Terrible. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> it was all over the TV. I think it's EastEnders. I've now got an episode coming up in which it appears as if a white man beats his Asian wife. Yeah, so that's what they're adding in now to the narrative. Oh, dear. 
Yeah. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, I actually, it's not unbelievable. It's it really is unbelievable. completely believable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, James, uh, your favorite character then? Who, who, who would you? Uh, which is your favourite character? Who, who, who do you like the most? It's a tricky one to pick because there's two or three I, I do actually like. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably, first of all, I would go with Michael's brother. Yes. That's the one I think I would pick first and most. Yes. I really yeah. liked him as a, as a character. I liked his motivations. I liked the way he acted, the, the, the actor himself, but also mean the way the character behaved in the script. I really liked I just I thought if I'd saw him and everything he did, and I've even seen being a, the you know the the watcher with the God's view to see everything he does good and bad. I still like him. I would go. I'd go for a pint with him. I I absolutely agree with you. And in fact, we've not really talked about him very much. And despite the we fact he's one actually. of the characters with a real uh, character arc and change. Yeah, yeah. It, it's interesting because. He's someone who strives to be better than he is, and yet Bleasdale puts everything in his way. And he gets belittled constantly by his own family, by his brother, and when he does try and achieve something, actually gets a respectable job and very rapid promotion. They're greatly impressed, Mm. which shows that he must be a very competent man and dedicated to his work. Even then, that still has another jab, and they abandon him, basically. (laughs) Albeit not wholly abandon him as a husband and father, but, you know, they get a petty sort of runaway in the car for another comedy scene. Yeah, that's that's right. But Bleasdale does these things because this is obviously part of his conscience. Who gets a cruel revenge? Who gets mocked? Who gets a petty uh, strike against him? These are all things that he writes in. That's right, yeah. And uh, Frankie, of course, uh, he's wanting to improve himself and Bleasdale tries to knock him down all the time. And a genuine uh, class man as well. He is, yeah. And and it just shows how much Bleasdale hates the white working class. Despite the fact, uh, again, this guy was not criminal. You know, he wasn't like any of the thugs. He stayed out of all that and just tried to be a decent man with a job, do well in the job, have a bit of pride and look after his family. You couldn't really ask for more. No, that's right. He doesn't get a happy uh, ending either, does he? Oh, it's not bad. I mean, he, he's... He's still got his family and he's got his a decent job. I would say he did all right. Mm. I mean, there was there was always joyride thing, but it was never suggested that that was any kind of breakup. It was more a huff, you know. It was a kind of childish huff and pranking him. Yeah. And remember, he's back with the mother and the family at the end, trying to ignore Michael Murray. He's Michael's panicking and shouting through the letterbox, so you know that he's obviously reconciled and everything's fine. Yeah, because they're shouting yeah, with him. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. That, I loved that ending to episode six, actually, when <laughs> you, you know when when the mother comes to confront Michael and uh, and she says, "Do you know where you're going, Michael? Do you know where you're going?" And he says, "I think I'm going to prison." And she says, "You're going to hell," because he, she's she's a devout Catholic. <laughs> and and then and then this is in the hotel, and so she she goes out of the hotel back to the mayoral car which they've stolen. And, <laughs> and, you know, and Michael Murray chases after her and then goes round to the driving side to, to plead with Frankie. And, and it's, it's his nephew there. That's right, it's the wee kid driving. That's right, that's, that's, right. right yeah. that's, that's a brilliant ending, actually. And, and so, yeah, so Bleasdale, he can write, you know, and, and he does write some good stuff. But you'll notice yeah. the best bits are always when he takes politics out of it. Yeah, and this is his problem, yeah. This is his problem, that everything to him is politics. And if he just wrote without the politics, which he does a lot more in The Boys from the Black stuff. Politics Mm. is not as foregrounded in Boys from the Black stuff. It's still there, but it's not as bad. There's only one of the episodes in that series which is very political. The the others are actually extremely well done. And it's because he's not as he's not foreground in politics as much. Mm. Right. But I suppose it was bound to happen if he does a series about a politician. There was that temptation. Yeah. So yeah, uh, um, my favourite character obviously is Frankie as well. Oh. Uh, for for me, he is the unsung hero of the series. Uh, and so, um, would anyone uh, like to add anything before we? Close this 
Mjolnir at the miniseries. The only this was one hell of a effort and adventure getting this done. I was sort of going, whew! <laughs> yeah, I think this, this episode is actually a couple of hours now. <laughs> yeah, I think it is. Oh God. I think it was a great little series because it really shows that even though it was made in 1990, you can still see pretty much the exact same thing happening now. Mm. And it's it's important as well that people realise that what happens in this applies everywhere around the world. Yeah. It's not exclusive to that city or just to Britain. The politics and the games being played and the dirty tricks is something that the left will do anywhere. It's something that can happen in politics all over the place. So it's, mm-hmm. it's educational as well, and it does show something about life and relationships. Yeah, you, you've only to look at, for example, Black Lives Matter now. Exactly yeah. the same thing is going on. Yeah. The Directed, left agitating yeah. ethnic minorities. So it, it was of its time and also ahead of its time, so it's lasted well. Mm, that's right. So is that what we're going to close on? I think so. Oh, my. Yes. So, if there's nothing further, then uh, goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from me. Goodbye. <laughs>